All right. Welcome back, everybody, to The Social Brain. Uh, today is going to be a really fun episode. Uh, it's something that I've really enjoyed researching. I know Andrew has as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about kind of learned helplessness and how that idea has kind of transformed into idea of learned hopefulness. Uh, and there is some really, really fascinating brain science in all of this. So uh, I'm going to kick it over to Andrew and he's going to get us started. I think he might have frozen a little bit, but <laughs> maybe. But while we are waiting for Andrew to unfreeze, <laughs> I. Oh, it looks like he's hopping okay. on right now. There he is. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry for that delay. I don't know uh, what that was, but all right. So, um, sorry. I think this is on my end. Maybe. Okay. All right. Okay, good. All right. Jeez. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on there. Uh, okay. Am I? I'm good on here, though. Oh yeah, yeah. We're gonna we're okay. gonna be hopeful about the rest of the episode. Okay, yeah, yeah. We're optimistic <laughs> about my internet. So okay, so um, I really think that uh, after doing this research, after learning a lot about this stuff, um, that one of the most empowering things you can do for yourself is become more hopeful. And that can just sound really trite. It can sound super simplistic, but um, like it can sound like I'm saying. You should just have faith that everything's going to work out regardless of what the actual reality is of your situation. Um, but uh, that's more like wishful thinking. And when we're talking about hope, what we're talking about in this episode is the, the preference that we want, the, the preferred outcome combined with uh, the belief that we can make that outcome happen. And um, we're going to get into some really interesting neuroscience research about how that kind of process comes to be in the brain, how we can come to learn to have more control over stressful situations and how much, how many benefits that can just have for our overall well-being and our life and our success and our satisfaction. Um, but yeah, like Taylor said, we're going to start in an unlikely place with, with learned helplessness <laughs> and depression. Um, so I guess first we'll just kind of get into the idea of learned helplessness. And um, I think probably the best way to understand what this is, is go back to some of the original experiments that <laughs> that m made it into a, a real concept in psychology. And um, these were done by someone we've talked about on this podcast before, uh, Martin Seligman and his collaborator, Stephen Mayer. And basically what they did was um, they started out using dogs and later on they, they used rats and even people. Um, but what they basically what they found was that if a person or an animal is exposed repeatedly to a stressful adverse event and they can't control the outcome of it, they learn to be helpless. They learn to not even try to get out of the situation. And worse than that, in future situations where they could control the situation, they kind of repeat that, that pattern of behavior where they're not even bothering to try. They're not attempting to get out of that situation. Um, and maybe Taylor, if you want to say a little more on that or, or uh, just yeah, hand yeah. it over to you. Uh, so I think the the overarching kind of idea that we want to get across in this episode is the importance of control, of having some sense of control in your life and how powerful that can actually be. Because what we see in the instances where we feel like we don't have control, uh, we see in tons of human research, we see this in all of these animal studies that Andrew's talking about, that it produces all of the symptoms that we see as traditional depression, anxiety, all of these uh, lethargy and apathy, uh, the unwillingness to, to try and to really put ourselves out there. Uh, and these, these early experiments, I mean, uh, 
it's amazing that you see like Martin Seligman that uh, that did a lot of this. He's like the positive psychology guy. It's really hard to put yourself in this perspective of like him shocking these dogs or these rats uh, because it must have been really hard research to do. I mean, they had they had these dogs uh, in these these boxes and they were shocking them. Right. Uh, and the really important thing to to get across in this is that these were incredibly controlled experiments. Right. So you have one dog that's getting shocked, but he has the ability to turn that shock off. He can push a button. The rat can spin a wheel, whatever it is. But when that dog spins that wheel or pushes the button, it's also turning off the shock in the other rats or the other dog's cage. So the two dogs are receiving the exact same shocks, the exact same duration. All of that stuff is exactly the same. And so you can you can see from this that the main difference was that one of the dogs had control overturning the shock off and the other one didn't. And the longer this goes on, the more you receive adversive, stressful events without any perceived kind of level of control in those environments, the more you start to develop these symptoms that look very traditionally like depression and anxiety. Uh, and what kind of the, the next step was in all of these experiments was that they put these animals into, it's called a shuttle box. It's basically this, this box that has a really easy way of escaping it. Uh, and you had some dogs and some rats would learn that it was really easy to get out of this thing and they would just go. But the dogs and the rats that had been shocked in the uncontrollable condition, they didn't even try to escape. They just kind of laid down, accepted their fate, kept getting shocked. Uh, and so this has really, really important kind of implications for the real world. So, yeah, but... Um... Later on, about 50 years after those experiments were done, those were done in the 1970s, um, a lot of work accumulated between 1970, I guess it was 1978 or something, <laughs> and 2018 and, and now. But in 2018, um, those original researchers published a new paper where they kind of flipped the idea of learned helplessness on its head. <laughs> So they said, we got it re in reverse or we got it wrong. Now, they they were a little bit like, I think, a little bit dramatic about that. But they <laughs> they did uh, find something really, really interesting. And I'm just going to kind of read the quote from the, the paper here so you can get an idea of, of how they looked at this. And they said, quote, passivity in response to shock is not learned. It is the default unlearned response to prolonged aversive events. This passivity can be overcome by learning control. So basically what they found was that, and we'll get into why this is the case, what convinced them that passivity and the learned helplessness was not really learned. It was the kind of the brain's default response to this kind of prolonged aversive um, exposure. And then what happens is that the brain learns to take control. And we're going to get into the, yeah. the mechanism, some of the kind of functional neuroanatomy of how that works. But that's, the, that's one of the big takeaways from this episode is that you can learn to kind of take control over aversive events. So we're going to talk about the neuroscience of that. Yeah. And as we get into the neuroscience, I mean, a lot of this, so Stephen Myers has been doing this for, for 20 years. He's done a lot of this with, with rats. That's how we really kind of figure out how these pathways work. Uh, but they're, they're kind of replicating a lot of these results in humans. Uh, and so a lot of these, these kind of learned helplessness experiments where you're like shocking dogs or shocking rats, they, they brought these in clever ways into the lab with humans as well. Uh, and so like it's been done with like really loud sound. Uh, and so you have humans that are like one condition, these really loud tones come on and one subject is able to turn the tone off, the other one isn't. And then they're provided with a similar kind of escape the tone shuttle box experience. And it's the same thing. And you have these people that were in this uncontrollable aversive thing are, are unable to, to kind of exert control. They, they act passive, they act with apathy. Right. And so something that's that's really important that I wanted to highlight as we get into the neuroscience is that even though a lot of this was discovered in rats, these pathways are we're seeing so many behavioral correlates in humans. 
to what we see in the rats, what we see in the dogs. And so a lot of these pathways, and, and there's now been some kind of neuroimaging that's done that we'll get into, uh, that's showing that it's pretty likely that these same pathways are involved in humans that have been really well characterized and detailed in rats. Yeah. And uh, I guess one other th um, thing I wanted to append to what you were just saying is um, that it wasn't only that human subjects who uh, had the inescapable shock or noise had symptoms similar to depression and anxiety, it, the, the reverse or the converse also occurred. So people who were depressed, who were actually clinically depressed or had higher symptoms of depression, but hadn't gone through this inescapable shock, uh, this learned helplessness yeah. experiment, they behaved in laboratory experiments in the same way as if they had been in the inescapable shock condition. So they, they basically gave up on <laughs> problems uh, prematurely and they showed the sort of passivity that is characteristic of that learned helplessness response. And I think that's important because this is, uh, from what has been shown in a lot of this literature, this seems to be sort of a, a generalized effect that the more you experience lack of control in your life, the more you're going to, ex to express passivity, apathy, and things in the future. Um, and this comes up a lot in like the, the addiction literature. There's things called like reward uh, deficiency syndrome. Uh, this idea of you've gone so much through your life without control, without uh, having the ability to accomplish things and, and to get yourself out of these situations. And it does affect the way that your brain is operating at a neural level. So I think it might be, we can maybe hop into some of this neuroscience. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And actually this is one of the comments in the chat from a game top hacker says how to control hormones in our brain. Um, we won't really be talking about hormones specifically, yeah. but uh, neurotransmitter release. Uh, so we're going to be talking about things like serotonin or, uh, and dopamine a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, this actually, that actually has a lot to do with what we're going to be talking about. The, uh, the brain's ability to control the release of, of uh, substances, neurotransmitters, not so much hormones, but um, do you want to start it off? Taylor? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and kind of on top of that, too. So Andrew and I have been kind of throwing around the idea of doing some AMA episodes. So like, ask me anything episodes. Uh, I noticed some of the questions are not kind of relevant to what we're talking about today. But we'll start collecting questions that we're not able to get to and maybe do an episode where we just kind of answer whatever people want to ask us. Um, and we just got a, a question from Jay Kawa that is exactly what we're going to get into. So is it possible to fight the learned helplessness? Absolutely. That's what all of this research is about. It's about cultivating the, the hope, cultivating a sense of control over that helplessness. Uh, and so I think the important thing is to really kind of jump into where the research started. So Stephen Meyer was like I said, doing a lot of this with rats and they were trying to, so they had these rats in these kind of learned helplessness experiments and they were trying to see what exactly, what brain regions were associated with uh, kind of the, the uncontrollable condition, the controllable condition. And there was this region that really stood out, the dorsal raphe nucleus, that is really, really interesting because it's tiny. Um, <laughs> So this thing is able to produce a lot of the symptoms that you would typically associate with depression, with anxiety, the lethargy, the passivity, right? The inability to, to act, to, to, to put yourself out there, to take risks, right? Um, in the human brain, it's about 150,000 neurons. Uh, and that's compared to the brain containing 100 billion neurons, right? Uh, so this thing is, is tiny. Uh, and something that he says that just really like blew my mind, like the brain is not a democracy, like this tiny little nucleus of cells in the midbrain has this enormous control over our behavior. Um, and what it's getting, what the raphe nucleus is getting, the dorsal raphe is these inputs from certain regions of the brain that are calculating stress, right? What kind of stressors are in our environment? And they're feeding that into the dorsal raphe nucleus. And the dorsal raphe nucleus is kind of summing all of these up and saying like, like how much stress is there in our environment? And how much should I kind of kick up my release of serotonin is what it kind of innervates the rest of the brain with. Um, and 
So if you have really stressful stuff going on from all these different angles in your environment, then this region is going to be super active. It's going to flood the brain with serotonin and it's going to produce a lot of these, uh, these types of symptoms that we would associate with it. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe kick it over to Andrew because you can talk maybe about the, the VMPFC. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to touch a little bit on, before yeah. we get to that, some of the, the brain regions that the dorsal rafe um, projects to. And why, and just be, because it's yeah. kind of helps to, I think, incorporate some of these ideas. Um, and the two main or the, I guess, three main ones that they point out in the paper are the uh, periaqueductal gray, which is in the brainstem, and the striatum, which is um, a part of the, the basal ganglia and the dopaminergic system, and the amygdala. And th this is interesting because when this region is activated, when the dorsal rafe is activated, and this happens during really any aversive event, when, when the animal is shocked, this region is activated and it sends um, inhibitory projections to the periaqueductal gray and the striatum. And what they're thinking this does is inhibits the kind of escape behaviors that are um, that would kind of maybe automatically occur otherwise, but it's inhibiting those. And these are two regions that are involved in uh, movement and in kind of um, uh, in those sorts of uh, reflex responses. And also it sends excitatory projections to the amygdala. And if you know anything about the amygdala, you've probably heard it in the context of fear and anxiety, where enhancing amygdala activity can add to kind of the experience of fear and anxiety. So it does this perfect storm where it's, it activates this one structure that then inhibits kind of the active escape yep. reflexes and activates the fear and anxiety response uh, through the amygdala. That, and that's fascinating. Oh, Amy, the amygdala, she gets so dramatic. <laughs> Uh, all right. No, and it's uh, that's a really good point because what is really fascinating about this work, uh, I mean, this is world renowned neuroscience that's taken 20 years to really map out, uh, is that it really maps on really well to the behaviors, right? That you have these animals that are not moving um, and are exhibiting like really high anxiety fear responses, right? They're shaking, they're, they're huddled up in fear. But what Stephen Meyer wanted to know was what was the difference between the control, the, the, the condition that had control, right? I can turn this off versus the condition that didn't. Um, and they were able to inject these tracers into the neurons in the dorsal raphe nucleus to see uh, what regions were kind of coming into it and communicating with it. And what they found is that they were able to trace it to this region in the frontal cortex, in the, the ventral medial frontal cortex. We've talked about this region tons on this show. Uh, it's involved a lot in kind of calculating a sense of self, a sense of purpose and meaning, right? Uh, but it's also really important to calculate a sense of control over our environment, right? And what they found was that this region is what is telling the dorsal rapé nucleus, calm down. I have control. We, we got this. Like, we don't need to freak out. We don't need to be super passive. We don't need to be in this fear state, right? Uh, and there's these really beautiful graphs that show that when the stress happens in both animals, in the control, the condition that has control and the condition that doesn't, serotonin just ramps up at the beginning. But the group that has control, all of a sudden, that serotonin just tanks and drops back down almost to baseline. But the other group that doesn't have control, it just stays up there. And it's it's what's kind of producing a lot of these effects that we see. And so it was this really kind of beautiful illustration that there's this control mechanism that, and they even did these really interesting studies because these like neuroscientists with rat research, they can turn these pathways on and off, right? And so what they found was, okay, I know that the VMPFC, this part of the frontal cortex that calculates whether I have control is telling the dorsal raphe nucleus to shut up, right? Like calm down. Uh, and so what they were able to do is they were able to just turn the VMPFC on in the group that didn't have any control. So this is the group that would have, that should have shown kind of passivity, should have shown like these, these effects of, of, of like being afraid. And, uh, and they showed that they didn't have any of those. 
So if you just turned on the VMPFC, you completely got rid of all of these lethargy and apathy. You shut down the dorsal raphe nucleus. And the exact opposite was true too. So the groups that did have control, if you blocked the VMPFC, they acted as if they didn't. Uh, and so it was this really, really nice demonstration that there's this really important region in the frontal lobe that if we use it, that we can control these helplessness situations. And it's so cool to th also think about the uh, some of the the projections of where the VMPFC sends uh, connections to, um, and uh, so one of them is of the uh, dorsal raphe nuclei uh, to inhibit that release of serotonin, like Taylor was just saying. Mm -hmm. So that that's that sense of control inhibiting that natural kind of helplessness response. But then on the other hand, uh, it also triggers a circuit between the VMPFC and the and a region called the dorsomedial striatum. And really all you have to know is that that region is involved in motivating behavior. And so it's again, it's this kind of like two uh, so bifurcating uh, signals where the VMPFC is sending an inhibitory signal to the dorsal raphe nuclei and an excitatory signal to the striatum. So it's simultaneously kind of saying, uh, don't act helpless and do something basically. Um, and there's this uh, uh, question again from Jay Kawa, what would the evolutionary purpose of the freeze response be? Um, maybe we can, we can uh, kind of answer that uh, real quick and then come yeah, back yeah. to some of this. So, um, do you want to take that or I, uh, I can't? So I, uh, it's, it's hard. Cause I mean, there is some speculation here, but I uh, think about it from the perspective of every time I try to do something, something bad happens, right? That I don't have any control over stopping these bad ha things from happening to me. And so if I freeze, if I get small, then maybe other things won't see me. Maybe they, the thing will just stop bugging me. Right. Uh, and and I really like so I know the last question was a was a joke, but you can I please <laughs> sign up to remove the VMPFC from my, from my brain? That's exactly the opposite of what we want to do because the VMPFC <laughs> yeah. is what's going to give us the sense of control. So and you got to think like humans have this this huge frontal lobe, right? And it's what really gives us a lot of the power to regulate our emotions, to regulate all of these things that are coming from the bottom up, right? And so if we're able to recognize that we're in this freeze response, that we feel helpless, we have this amazing ability as humans to recontextualize, right? To think about our situation and say, why do I feel helpless? Why am I freezing? Is it because of something that happened in the past that's still bleeding over into today? Can I then use this part of my brain to then cultivate hope, which I think the rest of the episode is going to be about, right? Uh, so that's kind of the overarching idea of what we want to get out of a lot of this neuroscience. So if we've kind of lost you in the names of brain regions and all that kind of stuff, uh, what we really want to encapsulate is that there's this really simple, uh, simple uh, <laughs> mechanism going on where it's essentially saying that if you don't feel like you have any control, then your brain is going to essentially like paralyze you. It's going to turn off the regions of your brain that are responsible for moving you, for taking risk, for taking action. And it's going to excite the regions that make you afraid. So you're going to sit there frozen and afraid. But if you use this other part of your brain to recontextualize, to, to think about any type of way that I may have control over this situation, because that's, that's the key, right? The VMPFC is calculating whether I have behavioral control whether I can do something. And that's what so much like therapy techniques are centered around is like giving you the ability to recontextualize your environmental stressors and to say like, okay, I may not have control over the way this person treats me, but I do have control over the way that I can kind of reframe that and decide what that does to me and how I can kind of deal with my emotions and things like that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I just wanted to uh, add on to the evolutionary part of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the freeze response in particular, there's also for like for prey animals, especially like uh, mice and rats, um, there is a particular evolutionary adap adapt adaptation that that sort of fulfills in that um, these animals are often hunted by 
by like birds and yeah. other predators and especially birds if you can stay still perfectly still on the ground when there's a bird above it's much less likely than it's going to be able to come up and snatch and eat you so for a mouse this freeze response would be particularly adaptive um and uh yeah so i just want to throw that in there and like um it. yeah um and then we got this other comment please like the stream guys need to reach so many more give them hope Thank you. Yes, please like the stream. <laughs> We're um, very hopeful about the future of this. <laughs> <laughs> we are. But like Taylor said, it's it's really about this future focus. It's about what I can do in this situation, even if it seems hopeless. And um, I actually I want to recommend a book. We're going to talk a little bit about his work in this episode. But um, this book uh, by this psychologist named Dan Tom Thomas Thomasula Thomasulo. Um, we've I've linked it in the description. He's got a really great talk on learned hopefulness, and that's really that's really what we're talking about here: learning hopefulness. And his whole book is just it's a really good kind of like user's manual um, on the psychological side. Doesn't really touch much on the neuroscience, but really gets into how to apply this in your own life especially when you're going through situations that seem hopeless or you've just undergone some kind of traumatic experience or some significant loss. Um, that's when these things are most important. And this kind of gets to this idea of immunization that, that came from this research as well, that just as when you're in the inescapable shock condition or you are learned helplessness, um, just as that can undergo this kind of neuroplastic learning process where you continue to act as though nothing can be done in these, in these stressful situations. Um, when you experience, when, when you're in those, those stressful or aversive situations and you exert control and you search for the, the possibilities of what can be done, um, that activates that VMPFC circuit we talked about, but that, also generalizes to future situations. And in fact, it's the stress plus the, the uh, sense of control that, that actually gives you that long lasting immunization from the learned helplessness response. And I think this is really important to dig in for a second, right? Because what we're, what we're getting at through all of this is that it's important to have a sense of control, right? But we go through our lives, we have control multiple times throughout our day, right? Choosing what we want to eat in the morning, choosing whether we want to take the bus or drive the car or whatever, right? Uh, why isn't, why aren't those levels of control immunizing us from stress? Uh, and what Andrew is hinting at is this, we need to think about neuroplasticity, right? This really kind of common neurons that fire together, wire together type idea, right? Uh, so, in order for neuroplasticity to work, you have to have two things active at the same time, right? This region that we've been talking about that's really involved with stress, with passivity, with all of these like depression type symptoms is the dorsal raphe nucleus. It's excited by stress, right? So if you just have stress, you're just going to get those symptoms, right? But if you have stress plus control, then these things are going to start wiring together right? So it's not enough to just have control. You have to have stress and control to be able to wire these things together. And the important piece of that is that you need to start practicing these hopefulness things during times of stress. It's good to learn about them when you're like not stressed and to, to know kind of what your options are, to know what the coping mechanisms are. But it's really during those times of intense adverse events practicing a sense of control, practicing a sense of hope that's actually going to wire these things together. And it's going to give that VMPFC more control in the future when you have more stressful events. Because like Andrew was saying, like when you see these immunization effects, you have people, you have animals that were in the control condition are then put in an inescapable one. They still act like they have control because they've like developed this belief about themselves that they can control their situation. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think when you haven't been exposed to this research and you haven't kind of seen like how these ideas really apply, um, 
some of what we're saying can sound like overly simplistic. You know, if you go through a, a horrible, heartbreaking episode, if someone close to you dies or something like that, some of this can seem like, well, what control do I have over that? What what control can I possibly have over that? And in those in some of those situations, it's going to be about taking control of your own mind and your own ability to cope with that event, believing that you can actually cope with it. I keep saying this and I, it sounds kind of woo, but it's it's really true. Believing that you can cope with something or that you can achieve a certain outcome is a prerequisite to achieving that outcome. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people, that's that's the initial battle is understanding that there are tools available and you have the capacity to learn to use those tools to cope with adversity. And I, I really like this, this comment that just came in right from, from Jay Kawa. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. But I, uh, so what gives me hope is usually remembering neuroplasticity, right? I, uh, and that really ties into the idea of a growth mindset. Uh, and I mean, this has been shown when you go and you, you teach like children about neuroplasticity, you teach them that like their brains are in a constant state of change, that they have the ability to not be fixed and be bad at something or to be stuck in something, uh, that that actually gives them the power, right? Because so much of this, uh, and I mean, this goes back to one of our like super early episodes on like mindfulness and things like that. Uh, default mode network is that so much of our thoughts are not things that we're consciously producing, right? So much of our beliefs are operating under the hood. It's not something that I, I think about my beliefs before I act. They're just kind of the filter that the actions go through, right? And it's it's those those beliefs that we really need to spend some like some personal time with, right? Because that's what, that's what, I mean, as Andrew's talking, like all of this stuff sounds woo, it sounds trite or whatever, but like there is kind of neurobiology behind all of this. The purpose of the frontal lobe is forward thinking. It's about abstracting. It's about thinking about things that have happened in the past and how I can project them into the future to accomplish things that are way off, right? And there's huge benefits to being optimistic. I mean, like from the research, like you live longer. Like, I think it's like on average six years longer, just being optimistic. Yeah. yeah. Like, and there's this interesting <laughs> little like passage from, from Martin Seligman from his mm -hmm. uh, book um, where he's talking about why it might be that, that being optimistic has that effect on your health. And I don't want to get too far into this, but it's kind of this idea that the brain is constantly simulating future scenarios that we are really future oriented, uh, at least at the level of the brain. It's kind of always trying to figure out mm -hmm. what's going to happen, what can be done, how, what our goals are and all that. But he's saying if, if you are constantly uh, in kind of a pessimistic state, you are always simulating these pessimistic negative futures. And that is going to have an effect on like your stress response, on your heart health, on your cardiovascular health. And if you're otherwise, on the other hand, if you are uh, simulating these positive, optimistic future scenarios, that maybe at least doesn't have that same uh, stress uh, or that negative stress response that can have those negative health effects on your your blood vessels and on your heart. And um, and I think fundamentally, what we're talking about, or at least it's it's a really closely related idea, is the idea of a growth mindset that seeing negativity and difficulty and challenges as not as obstacles that are going to stop you, but as learning opportunities for something that you can get past. And uh, we've talked about this in past episodes before, but it, I think it keeps coming up because it's such, it's so important for living our lives and for accomplishing our goals and getting through adversity. Yeah. Uh, and something that I was just about to talk about, we just got a question on, uh, is I want to be really clear that this is not easy. That what, what we really have to think about is everything Andrew was just talking about is that our brain is a predictive machine. It's trying to predict what the future holds, right? And you have to think about what inputs are going into that prediction. And a lot of the inputs are what happened in the past, right? 
And so if you come from a lot of negative things that have happened, if you come from abusive relationships, if you come from a really, really like tough childhood, right? Where you really didn't have the ability to practice control, to have any type of control. You were in this helpless situation, right? Your brain has, has created that predictive state going forward. It's not just about being pessimistic or being optimistic, right? Like there's a lot of genes that influence this as well. Uh, this is something that we have to, to practice a lot of reflective power to be able to notice in the first place, right? That we really have to understand how much of our environment is going into those future predictions. And I mean, when you look at a lot of the, the people that study consciousness and all of these things these days, talk about 98% of what our brain does is completely unconscious. We're not aware of it, right? And so your fears, your anxieties, all of these past events are all swirling together to create this perception of what the future holds. And you really have to spend some time like looking through that to figure out what is going into this input, what is going into this prediction. Because it's it's really nice to say, just be optimistic. Uh, but that's going to take a lot of effort. And it's something we talked about on the last episode that like, if you want to be a, a more kind of fit person, you go and you work out at the gym. If you want to be a more hopeful person, you practice hopefulness, you practice gratitude, yeah. like you bring things that may have happened that were good in the past into the present to try to give you some hope for the future. Yeah. And you don't stop. I mean, if you want to be a fit person, you don't stop going to the gym, unfortunately, kind of. <laughs> but yeah. it's like you become the type of person who goes to the gym because being that type of person is something, Taylor, you've talked about in the past, that becomes part of your identity. Yeah. That's how you get that long-term behavioral change. It's not that, oh, I, I want to lose 10 pounds. It's I am the type of person who takes the best care of my body as I possibly can or something along those lines. But it's it's like bringing that into focus and uh, and putting that kind of bringing it as a part of your identity so that you continue to practice these things. And some of the, the exercises that emerge from this research seem, again, you have to open your mind and you have to be okay with doing some stuff that seems a little woo sometimes because <laughs> it is evidence-based, it's research-backed, it really does help people. Yeah. And part of one of these um, is... Uh, this exercise that a lot of like life coaches use, but increasingly like positive psychotherapy, I think they, they employ this technique, which is this best possible self exercise and focusing on what your best possible future self will look like and using that as increasing, like practicing, um, visualizing that future and being detailed with it and putting that into your mind, feeding that into the simulation as Taylor's talking about again and again, and, and combined with this sense of hope, this, I can do, I can, what can I do um, to make this happen? Combining those two can be a really powerful way to kind of build up this optimistic uh, future thinking. And we're incredibly loss averse as, as a species, like we don't want to lose what we have. Uh, and so we have this like really strong negativity bias to just like avoid, avoid, avoid. Um, and something that was really interesting that, that, uh, Dr. Thomas Solo brings up in the, the video that Andrew mentioned, uh, is he talks about this negativity bias as being like the scale. Like if you're really trying to like tip the scale away from negativity and in, in like, to positivity, uh, you have to realize that negative thoughts, negative past experiences, this, this bias data set that uh, is coming up in the in the comments, right, uh, is those things are like pebbles, like rocks. They're really heavy, like one negative thought. And I mean, I can I can see this just from like interactions I've had with like students. I'll have like a lot of students that like my class and one that doesn't. And that one that doesn't would just be like, ah, uh, I. <laughs> But it shows that like the positive stuff is like feathers, right? And if you're trying to balance this stuff out, you need a lot more feathers to balance out one negative rock, right? And this is where that identity stuff really comes into play is that like you really have to go through your day saying like, this is who I am. Like I am someone who, who wants to be kind to other people, who wants to practice gratitude, who wants to be compassionate, not just to other people, but to myself, 
right? And I think th as a social scientist myself, right, something that I really want to highlight that makes a lot of this really difficult is that most of what we're fighting is expectations of other people, right? Like, if you really want to change, you have the power to do that. But what a lot of the fear comes in is that if I change, that means I'm not the same person with this person anymore, that they're not going to see me the same way. Uh, and it, it takes a lot to, to really kind of, you have to have the conversations. You have to say like, look, I want to be different. Um, and you really have to give a lot of credit to the power that your family has, the power that your friends have, uh, that if you want to change, you need to make sure that they're on board with you changing and that they want to support that growth. And if they're not, that's, that's really their loss. Um, mm -hmm. But then on the flip side of that, with the social side of things, a lot of, um, a, a lot of our problems come from also not being willing to reach out to people. Like, I know yeah. this is, this is something that I, I constantly kind of fight against in myself. <laughs> I'm like naturally very like individualistic and focused. I, I pr prefer to do like individual group our individual work rather than group work is putting yeah. this podcast aside. Um, <laughs> I, but um, I, I tend to rely maybe too much on myself. And I think uh, it's really important to realize that sometimes often when you're going through something that seems um, inescapable or, uh, you know, you can't get through this, this is too hard. Oftentimes you can, and what you can do is reach out to other people and reach out to maybe a mental health professional or just a good friend. Um, you know, it's amazing what kind of effect uh, another person's thinking, a, a good conversation can have on these kind of predictions for, for what's possible in your future. I did this really interesting uh, activity with, uh, with my, student, my group dynamic students at the end of the term. It's called the Johari window. Uh, and you spend time filling out the first box of like what I think other people see in me. Right. And you spend all this time writing that. And then you pass the paper around and you give like like a minute or two. Uh, and the other box is what people actually see. And so you pass it around. And these people have been interacting all term. They like know each other at this point. Uh, and they list all of these things that they see in you that you maybe don't see in yourself. Right. And then at the end of the entire thing, you have this other box down at the bottom. That's your facade, which is the things that you're hiding from other people. Right. The things that you just keep for yourself. Um, and what a lot of that kind of gets at is that uh, there's this way to bring your authentic self out, that there may be this disconnect between how you think people see you and how people really see you. Something that Andrew was talking about that's really important is that these biased data sets that are going into the prediction, right, are things that you're wrapped up in. But if you can get other people to acknowledge you, to recognize you, to tell you what your strengths are. And to, to kind of boost you up and say, look, you do have control. You do have power. Uh, that that goes a long way. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. And and for those strengths that you might not have reaching out to other people who can who do have those strengths and, and can help you get past this barrier uh, with their with their abilities. That is something that you are doing. You're actively pulling that teammate in. And then that is is going to help you move forward, too. But that's all that's I, I love that point. Um, okay. I think just real quick, I think it's really important to highlight effort <laughs> that the frontal lobe, a lot of these things that we're talking about are things that involve like volition. <laughs> they involve you actually. And that's I uh, there's there's neuroscience behind this. Like it may sound like we're just like doing a, a 30 minute therapy call or whatever, but I I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's there's really interesting work with addiction uh, and there's uh, there's similar uh, kind of patterns that are seen with people with depression and anxiety that there tends to be a hypoactivity of the frontal lobe, which means that the frontal lobe is not as active as it is in controls. Uh, you see this a ton with addiction that like the impulsive short term stuff in the midbrain is super active and the frontal lobe is not. Uh, and, but you see, you also see this with depression, with anxiety, uh, that these, these emotion regions are really active. These fear regions are really active and the regions that are supposed to counteract those are not. And there have been these really interesting studies 
that didn't use any type of pharmacology or anything. They just brought people in and said, think about the future. Think about what the future holds. Think about kind of things that might go good, things that might go bad. And just practicing thinking about the future was engaging their frontal lobe. And they could see this on brain scans. And it was also correlated with reductions in cravings, with a higher ability to regulate emotions, right? And so even though a lot of this stuff sounds trite, sounds like, okay, you're telling me to just go be grateful, whatever. Um, we're actually telling you that there's this incredible part of your brain that you've been bestowed with as a human that requires effort to activate. And if you don't use it, then you end up unable to regulate. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. And it's like the, uh, the other, th something I was thinking about while you're saying that is in depression, I did this whole, um, episode you can check out on my channel about depression and neuroplasticity. And, uh, there's this model of depression developed by, um, the scientists, uh, Rebecca Price and Ronald Duman. And this idea that depression is kind of fundamentally about a lack of of neuroplasticity, a lack of the ability to learn. But I think maybe more specifically, now that we've kind of looked into this stuff, it's a lack of ability to learn control over yeah. the situation. So it's this disruption in this uh, PFC, maybe dorsal raphe uh, nuclei <laughs> uh, circuit or the, um, and, and the amygdala uh, as the, the extension of that kind of, um, and, uh, oh man, I was going to say one of, the, oh yeah. And another, um, kind of piece of neuroscience that we can link to this is, uh, I recently did a video about, um, some of the neural, uh, mechanisms involved in happiness and joy and pleasure. And I talked about this idea called the pleasure cycle from, um, Kent Barrage and, uh, Morton Kringlebach. And these guys have been studying yeah. pleasure for a really long time. And, um, and they found that there's this cycle that our brains go through when we learn to kind of take on a new habit or, or yeah, learn in any kind of sort of habitual behavioral learning is this cycle of, well, we expect a, a certain um, reward, a sp certain thing to occur when we take a certain action. When we take that action, we get that pleasure response, we get that reward, and then we go through this period of learning how to uh, do that again in the future. And that's kind of simplified. But um, they talk about depression as being a disruption in that cycle, that that pleasure cycle, that um, sort of hedonic behavioral learning cycle. And so I think there's something you can see there where when that gets disrupted, that system is really about motivated behavior. And that's another way of looking at this lack of control from the prefrontal cortex being able to activate the uh, the brain regions involved in motivated behavior. So, if anybody's thinking we're getting a little bit too too soft science, we're throwing some <laughs> hard neuroscience right there. <laughs> right, uh, and all of this is is talking about ways to to motivate behavior. Right, we're talking about acting. Uh, and there's two kind of ways that you can be. You can either be kind of where you are, kind of exploiting what you have, or you can be out exploring, motivated, right? Doing things. Uh, and there's benefits to both of those because I don't want to like, uh, like serotonin, which is released by the dorsal raphe nucleus that causes like passivity and like, that's important. Like, there are moments where, I mean, that's considered one of the like here and now chemicals, right? That uh, there are moments where we do want to kind of turn off the future thinking. Because uh, I don't want this to come off as like, you need to just spend lots and lots of time just thinking and hoping about the future. Uh, because that also turns into rumination, right? And it can also turn into if you're thinking too much about the future and then you're not accomplishing anything and you're like, well, and then all of a sudden that turns into negative feedback loops and things like that. So with everything that we've discussed in this show, it's it's always this, this really nice balance. You're trying to find homeostasis with these things. You're trying to find like, okay, I need to put myself into a state of hope. I need to think about the future. I need to think about what I can accomplish. But I also need to take time like appreciating the here and now and like being present right yeah yeah this should not come off as like <laughs> serotonin bad uh, yeah. because it's not and it's um there are times when when that 
that serotonin is really important for coping with adversity, maybe not the active coping that we're talking yeah. about here, but the passive coping, the ability to accept what's happening and, and yeah. to reframe it as, as something uh, not detrimental, but some, a reality that you have to accept that is, you know, a negative in some way. And I, I did this video a while back on this theory about the function of serotonin. And it kind of came down to this idea that it is about um, adversity, about, I, I mean, and in light of this research, it seems like about kind of tamping down our stress response to adversity so that we can accept it. But again, this is a bit of speculation <laughs> on my part, but check out that video if you're interested. Yeah. And I mean, I think something that we didn't have a chance to get into in our last episode was some of the work from Barbara Fredrickson, uh, who gets mentioned a lot in kind of the positive psychology world. Uh, but one of the, the really interesting things about bringing a lot of this positivity into your life is that it, it changes the way that you see the world. Like your attention changes. Uh, and there have been these really interest, interesting studies that they've done where they've shown that like people that are in these like pessimistic viewpoints uh, tend to see things in a very kind of like focused, narrow way. Uh, they don't kind of see the, the forest. They see the individual trees. Um, and that can be a problem kind of tying it into what we're talking about with this episode of like the more you experience positive emotion, the more you're able to kind of broaden your horizon and see the whole picture for what it is. And if you're in this kind of pessimistic viewpoint all the time of just looking at these individual details, then you're starting to build this story without kind of the whole picture in mind. Right. And you're kind of focusing in on like the negative things that, that, that might be contributing to you feeling bad and getting stuck on that and ruminating on that. Um, and so this is just it's a really interesting kind of phenomenon that's been shown that like our attention changes. We go to this like wide attention versus this really kind of narrow attention when we practice these kind of things. Yeah. And that's part of her uh, Barbara Fredrickson's idea of um, positive emotions are about broadening and building and that yeah. Taylor was just talking about kind of the broadening where they, these positive emotions open our awareness and kind of change, literally change our perception. So they've shown that people are after being induced into these positive emotional states, they're more uh, likely to, or they're kind of biased toward what's called global or holistic processing, seeing like what Taylor mm. was saying, seeing the, the forest rather than the individual trees. Um, they've done these eye tracking experiments where positive emotions bias people toward seeing the periphery of their vision rather than just kind of the, uh, the center. Um, brain imaging, where it seems to make our brains more likely to process the context behind an image. Um, so maybe you guys are now because you're so hopeful and positive from this episode, you're seeing all the books and trying to read all the, 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 uh, covers in, in Taylor's background back there. Um, but, uh, yeah, when, and, and then the, in, with memory too, that positive emotions give us better memory for the details of the context or yeah. surrounding whatever the kind of focus of the image is. Um, and then the, uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say then the the kind of uh, building uh, part of the broaden and build theory is that we sort of uh, build more um, kind of activities, more like motivation to to do more things. But I might be getting that a little bit off. Hang on. Sorry. No, I mean, I mean, we got a question from Bruce, too. Uh, you you've just explained why visualizing the crowd and embarrassing attire is a common way to overcome stage fright. I mean, you're, you're practicing these like positive emotions, right? You're like trying to reframe, recontextualize, bring hope into the moment so that you're not kind of paralyzed by fear. Uh, that could definitely be associated with this. And something that is really, really interesting that I've thought a lot about. So we had an episode on um kind of the insula earlier in our in our series uh this guy bud craig but he's really talked about how um the whole like left right brain thing is kind of crap the way that most people think about it like left brain is analytical and right brain is creative or whatever uh but what he started to see from his research is that it's more of a left brain is rest and digest and right brain is more of like fight or flight 
Um, and kind of building on what Andrew was just saying with all this work from Barbara Fredrickson, this kind of this building uh, process that when you have positive emotions, you're kind of on the rest and digest side of things, right? You're, you're, you're building yourself up. You can't build yourself up when you're in a fight or flight mode, right? But we have to have both of those types of behaviors, right? We have to be able to avoid threat. So we change the way our blood flows to our body and helps us to run away, right? We bring stuff away from our gut to, that's actually giving us the resources to build and do those things, right? And you show that like people that are, are hit, and we've talked about this on our mindfulness episode, but people that spend 10,000 hours meditating have this increased cortical thickness on the left half of their brain. And it takes like, you can't be really in a fight or flight mode to be like sitting there still with your eyes closed. Right. Um, and so, so much of a lot of this, I think is, is cultivating this belief in yourself that you are safe enough to rest, to digest, to grow, to build, um, and that you don't need to be afraid of these threatening things. You have control. Like that's the overarching idea from all of this is how to cultivate that. And, We've talked about a lot of like soft science, whatever, um, but we've tied it to a lot of these these hardwired neural mechanisms, right? That we live, we have this phenomenological experience of having some semblance of control over our thoughts, over our actions and behaviors. And the more we can cultivate that, the more we can believe, even if free will doesn't exist, I don't want to have that debate right now, believe that it does. <laughs> Right. Like have that belief, because if you believe that you have free will, if you believe that you have the ability to change your circumstance and not even just like change the entire environment, change your family, change your relationship, change the way your boss yells at you, whatever. You can't change those things, but you can change the way that they affect you. Right. And the more you internalize that idea, like I can regulate the anger I'm having. I can regulate the sadness that I'm having from this. I can contextualize it. I can understand it. I know that I have the ability to move forward past this. The more you can practice that, the more you're building those circuits and the more resilient you're going to become. Grow and build. Yeah, that's really great. And and uh, just tacking on to your um, comment about the left forebrain, yeah. the left insula being more associated with rest and digest it's actually there's actually evidence of the the pfc and also the amygdala the left side um being more associated with positive motions so um and one interesting thing about that i think in the context of what we're talking about here with this reframing and really verbalizing your experience and then you know, what you the future could look like you know actually mm -hmm. saying or, or writing that down and so much of this comes down to like journaling and and uh, talking, and it's you know maybe not a coincidence that the left side of the brain is where most of the speech and uh, language production circuits are. So the right side has very few, almost none, I think, um, and the left has pretty much all of those language producing networks. So it may, it may not be a coincidence that when you are reframing these experiences and trying to see a more positive future that you're you're activating this left hemisphere um and yeah just i just find that that really interesting that association <laughs> but uh let's see we got another question here all right uh, yeah, they're saying they wish they they knew uh, of a, a study with emotional processing like centered our way later. Uh, we have loved the engagement, the interaction uh, this episode. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, Andrew and I have been tossing around the idea of doing like an Ask Me Anything episode so that we can meet more often. Uh, this every two weeks kind of thing is actually to give us time to research these topics that we can provide the, the most kind of uh, relevant and up-to-date information that we can. Um, so can one develop their passive coping system is a question we just got. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Why don't you try, Andrew? I was just going to say that I think probably that mindfulness and, uh, and meditation and those kinds of practices are probably the most direct way of doing that just because yep. there's so much about uh, just noticing what's happening in the present, noticing what your experience is, whether it's thoughts or emotions or memories coming up 
and just being non-judgmental about that and allowing them to pass. And, and you're not trying to tamp them down. You're not trying to engage this future thinking. It's about the here and now and about kind of accepting what's happening. Yeah. And the more you practice that, I mean, there's tons of research, even like five minutes a day of meditation um, or of mindfulness or whatever it is, uh, it has pretty profound effects uh, and it becomes passive. Uh, that's this whole idea of like the 98% being unconscious, right? Uh, is that we're trying to build these things in. We're trying to automatize a lot of these practices, these behaviors. And the more you catch yourself, uh, this is just doing these episodes. I've been noticing so much more of just like, uh, like my dog wanting attention from me and me being really tired and just like, no, not right now. But then like, you know what? Me petting you is probably giving me some type of good <laughs> feeling. So like, <laughs> right. And the more you catch yourself in those moments, the more you can start building up the feathers uh, and really start outweighing the pebbles. So uh, I think we're at time. Thank you everyone for continuing to listen. This was really fun. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and do make sure to like and subscribe uh, to both our channels. I run Sense of Mind and Taylor runs uh, The Cellular Republic. So check that out. Links are in the description to all of that. Also check out the podcast version of The Social Brain if you want to just take the audio with you and you maybe don't catch the live. Um, that is, it's The Social Brain and there's a link in the description. And if you want to support us, consider checking out our Patreon. We've got a QR code yep. right above Taylor's head over there. <laughs> and also there's a link in the description, uh, patreon.com slash the social brain. Check it out. We would love to get some support. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll probably be, I'll be maybe posting something soon about um, questions, uh, g gathering questions from you guys for, for maybe a future AMA episode, like Taylor said. Awesome. And uh, another way to support me as well, my wife runs an Etsy shop. Uh, I usually have the link below in all of my videos, but she sells a lot of kind of uh, therapy inspired shirts. She is a clinical therapist, uh, but there's neuroscience and data science stuff, really cool gifts and mugs and stuff like that. So check it out. Awesome. All right. Well, we will catch you next time.